Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Today I'd like to talk about chronic illness and healing in Christians, and this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart because I've had chronic health problems since I was a child and have lived a limited lifestyle as a result. I'm hoping this video will bring you comfort if you're suffering. The Christian community, for the most part, is compassionate in dealing with the sick, but unfortunately there are some minister saints and even entire groups who believe that Christians should always be healed. The Word of Faith movement and the New um, Apostolic Reformation are two groups that spring to mind. But the idea exists scattered throughout the evangelical Christian community. Prosperity preachers do not prepare people for the reality of life as a Christian. We still navigate all the ups and downs of life in this world. We get sick, we get old, we have our hearts broken, we struggle in many ways, even financially at times, and it's just part of living a normal life. Now some would say, oh, well, I don't want to live a normal life, I want to live an abundant life, you know, John 10:10. 10, 10. Well, <laughs> Sure, don't we all? But, you know, I've noticed when they get sick and hurt, they still go to the doctor or the chiropractor, just like everybody else. And it's not lost on me that when many of them get up to preach, they haul out their glasses to read their text. You'd think a minister who had enough faith to believe for a multi-million dollar private jet would uh, be able to muster up enough faith to get his wife's eyes fixed, wouldn't you? They also rarely acknowledge that many of them have had cancer and have only survived because of the medical treatments they've received. They're selling the fantasy of miracles being a normal daily occurrence, but it's, not, it's just not a reality for anyone, including them. That whole movement is an embarrassment to Christianity, and it has become a three-ring circus of spiritualized greed. I can remember having a rough day years ago and I'd been sick all day and in a lot of pain and I was feeling exhausted and overwhelmed. When you deal with a chronic or long-term illness, the mental battle becomes almost as challenging as the physical one. So I decided to lie down on the couch all wrapped up in my blanket with my heating pad and I thought I would watch some Christian TV, you know, hoping for some encouragement. <laughs> well, the second I turned it on, there was this prominent prosperity preacher speaking and the very first words out of his mouth were, if you're a believer and you're sick, it's because you want to be. <laughs> How encouraging. Um, I may have said something very rude to him through the screen and then promptly shut it off because, you know, but uh, thanks for nothing. This mindset can be so discouraging and damaging to people. I personally once heard a minister say, if you're a Christian and you're sick, you're in no position to share the gospel with anyone because you're not walking in the victory that Jesus paid for. So I don't know. Like, I mean, what? Are we bad PR at that point? What's walking in victory? Is it living a problem-free, wealthy, perfectly healthy life? I mean, nobody can share the gospel if that was the prerequisite. People with these beliefs often view ongoing sickness in believers as a result of a lack of faith, negative confession, sin in your life, demonic oppression, the list goes on. But, you know, ultimately, it's your fault. And I can tell you, suffering is hard, but being judged for your suffering, that's even harder. There's an old saying, the Christian army is the only army in the world that shoots its wounded. The prosperity doctrine does just that to suffering people. It's cruel and it's a dishonest representation of scripture. Well, you might say to me, what about 3 John 1, 2? Prosperity preachers love that one. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. See, God wants us to be healthy and wealthy. This is a greeting at the beginning of a letter from John to Gaius, basically saying, Hey, buddy, I hear you're doing well spiritually. I hope this letter finds you doing just as well physically. Read the verses. Context is everything. You can't just pluck that out. It's not a decree from the throne room that we should be healthy and wealthy or that the condition of our physical health is a direct reflection of our spiritual health. That's foolish. We all know of evil people who are very healthy and wealthy, so that's certainly not the measuring stick. So why do people get sick? Well, we live in a fallen world, subject to death, 
heredity affects us, our environment affects us, sometimes our lifestyle choices aren't the best, and our bodies are breaking down, and we will all eventually die, and often it will be of a disease of some kind. It's not a real uplifting thought, but it is true nonetheless. Now, the New Testament is full of sick people. Some were healed, some were not. The Gospels and the Book of Acts were full of healing, and we often hold them up as the norm. But they represented a very special time of signs and miracles, which confirmed the message of the Gospel and the legitimacy of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you know, the prophesied Messiah. John 3, 2 says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So the signs confirmed that Jesus was sent from God. You have the story of the blind man in John 9, 2, and they asked, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. If we look at the story of Lazarus in John eleven four, it says, But when Jesus heard this, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. So sometimes God allowed sickness so he could show his glory through his son, confirming that Jesus was who he said he was. We also see in the Gospels where Jesus gave his disciples power and authority to heal diseases in his name. Jesus himself healed many people. In fact, in Matthew 9.35, it says, And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. I mean, can you imagine? Wouldn't that have been amazing? But it all confirmed the authenticity of Jesus at a time when it was likely in question. In Matthew 9, 20 through 22, you have the woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. And she was healed. And what did Jesus say to her? He said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. In Luke 17, 19, when Jesus healed the lepers, he said, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So we can also conclude that there is sometimes a link between faith and healing. But we can't conclude that the absence of healing is always a result of a lack of faith. Because other times Jesus healed people indiscriminately. Not to mention that there were godly people in the epistles that weren't healed at all. And I'm sure they had faith. I know of people who have had so much faith for healing that they've gone off their medications and ended up ill. And some even in the hospital. I mean, that's faith. But it didn't produce a healing. The Bible also mentions that demonic oppression can cause physical symptoms in Matthew 7, 14 through 18 and Luke 13, 10 through 16. But it never indicates that this is a common cause of illness. Unfortunately, this has left some people looking for a demon around every corner and convinced that every sickness is of the devil. Unless, of course, they get sick. But, you know, then that one's not. But the rest are. <laughs> um, but if you pay attention to the timeline... Once you get to the epistles, the healings and miracles dropped off considerably. The Apostle Paul himself was sick, which he acknowledged in a letter he wrote to the believers at Galatia. Galatians 4.13 says, You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. So what then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. So he was ill. Sounds like it had something to do with his eyes. And he stayed with them long enough that he felt his care had become a trial for them. So where's the miracle here? I mean, this is the Apostle Paul. <laughs> you know, surely after his Damascus Road experience and all the miracles that he'd been a part of previously, he had that mountain-moving faith they speak of. But his faith couldn't produce a miracle when he was sick. He had to be cared for by the Galatians. He also battled a thorn in the flesh. Now, some believe it was a false teacher who was a burden and a torment to him. Now, and others believe it was a physical ailment, possibly a facial disfigurement or, you know, the poor eyesight thing. 
But he says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me and keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We really don't know what it was. But it's interesting how it played out. I mean, three times he prayed that God would deliver him. So why weren't his prayers answered? Did he have sin in his life or did he have a lack of faith? It sounds to me like Paul's three prayers were answered and God said no. And Paul resigned himself to that. Do we ever accept no as an answer? Or do we believe the only answered prayers are when we get exactly what we asked for? Philippians 4. 25 through 28. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So here you've got Paul. He's sitting in a Roman prison cell. The believers at Philippi sent Epaphroditus to help care for him and bring him aid and supplies. You'll find that referenced in Philippians 4.18. And in the process, Epaphroditus becomes ill, deathly ill. It's interesting because this is the same Apostle Paul who eight years earlier in Ephesus was so full of the power of God that handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken away and given to sick people and they were healed. And so, I mean, he's seen the mighty power of God in action, like we, in ways we could only dream of, but he couldn't speak a miracle over Epaphroditus. He just sounded fragile and broken, saying God had mercy on him and me because I could not have handled sorrow upon sorrow. Paul sounded like he was hoping to relieve his anxiety by sending Epaphroditus back to them and that his mental health at the time was precarious. Like one more thing might break him. Any little thing might be the straw that breaks a camel's back. Ever felt that way? Fragile and overwhelmed? Like we just could not handle anything else? If you suffer with chronic illness, you likely have. So even though Epaphroditus pulled through, it was a trial. No miracle here, no magic formula, just normal people struggling, caring for one another and dealing with life. And sometimes life is hard. It just is. About a year later, you have Paul writing a letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23. And he said, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thy often infirmities. So Timothy was not a well man. He had stomach problems and he was apparently often sick and infirmed. But it's so funny that Paul didn't ask Timothy. He didn't say, you know, what's wrong with your faith? Have you been positively confessing scriptures? You know, have you called for the elders of the church to anoint with oil? Have you rebuked that spirit of infirmity? <laughs> he didn't make any assumptions. He just gave Timothy some practical advice for managing his ongoing health problems, much like a doctor would do. Again, no miracle here. Just care. 2 Timothy 4.20 says, Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. So while traveling on their missionary journeys, Trophimus became ill, and they just had to keep going and leave him behind. Now, didn't Paul have compassion on his friend and pray for him to be healed? I mean, I'm guessing he probably did. But since the power to heal comes from God alone, even the Apostle Paul couldn't manufacture a healing. And when we get sick, of course, we, we do pray, but we can't guarantee results either because the power is God's alone. So are there things we can do when we get sick? Well, yes. James 5.14 says, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So do we call for godly Christian elders to come and anoint us with oil and pray when, when we're sick? Sure, of course. 
Um, do we pray the prayer of faith and confess our sins? Absolutely, but I think I'd be careful who I confess to. Not everybody's trustworthy. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But what if you've tried it all and nothing's worked? What now? It's so hard as Christians to let go of the idea of healing when we see verses like 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I think it's safe to say that we don't understand these things. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, Now we see things imperfectly, like a puzzling reflection in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. We have very limited understanding. I'll say taking medication, having surgery, consulting doctors, and even our own body's natural healing ability are all pathways to improved health. And I do believe God works through those things too. It's not a lack of faith to go to the doctor or take medication. Even Jesus himself acknowledged that sick people go to the doctor in Matthew 9, 12. He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I mean, he was just making a common sense statement there in the middle of a point he was making. Colossians 4.14 refers to Luke as a beloved physician. Scripture does not speak negatively of doctors or medical care. It's biblically irresponsible to imply that supernatural physical healing is guaranteed for everyone who can get the formula just right and have enough faith. And this has sometimes led to harsh judgment of suffering people within the Christian community and it's led others to stress over their own apparent lack of faith because they couldn't get healed. And in extreme cases, it has even caused people not to seek medical care for themselves or their children as an act of faith. And this is dangerous. Look, when you get sick, you go to the doctor, okay? You can pray in the car on the drive there. And if God does heal you, well, it's pretty easy to cancel an appointment. We need to be sensible. Other times, healing may not occur because it's simply God's time to take a believer home. Death really is the ultimate healing for us as Christians. Our glorified body is going to be perfect, and we have that promise to look forward to. But that doesn't make it any less scary because it's still the unknown, and we're still human. When we pray for a loved one and they die without receiving healing, it can shipwreck a person's faith because it feels like God didn't keep his promises. There's so much we don't understand. And look, I'll be honest. I don't understand why God doesn't do more either. I'm full of questions too. I certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. Do I believe God heals? Yes, I do. But I've spent the majority of my life sick. If you look around, healing and miracles are the exception rather than the norm. God heals according to his will and not ours. And I won't even begin to pretend that I understand his will. But it doesn't mean that we don't still pray. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Is there a point where we stop pressing and working and stressing and striving for healing? We stop fasting and confessing scriptures and just binding the devil and calling it in and just rest in knowing that for whatever reason, healing may not come for us. The answer might be a no, and that's okay. I mean, it's disappointing, but it's okay because we have a heavenly father who loves us and he's going to be with us and he's faithful to see us through. And I believe that when we honor and praise him in spite of our pain and in spite of our troubles, that is what a sacrifice of praise is. It's not screaming and carrying on in a church service. It's deep. It's deeper than that. Sometimes he does heal and deliver, but usually we just have to go through. Even in scripture, sometimes the apostles were released from prison. I mean, in Acts 16, 25 through 40, you have Paul and Silas, they're in jail. I mean, God shook that place loose. And uh, 
he set them free and the jailer and his family were converted because of it. But then other times they served miserable prison sentences. And I'm sure they prayed while they were in there that God would deliver them, but he didn't. Why? I don't know. I really don't know. Most of them ended up being martyred for their faith. So, I mean, this wasn't exactly a, a happy ending by earthly standards, which is why I don't understand how the word of faith movement can present the Christian life like it's a cakewalk. You know, like God's this genie in the lamp that if we can just rub him just the right way, that he'll appear to grant us all our wishes for an easy, happy, luxurious, healthy, wealthy life. Jesus certainly didn't present the Christian life that way. If you look at Matthew 25, 35, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. No big miracle there. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see, basically, and they listed all these things, if you skip to verse 40, and the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. That looks to me like love and practical caregiving, not a big boatload of miracles. Revelation 21, 3 through 5 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. That sounds good. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It's expected that in this life, we're going to have tears, pain, death. But our hope is eternal. And God is going to make all things new. Sick people are not second class Christians. Now, nor were they in scripture. There's a place and a purpose for us within the body of Christ, and we are not promised that our lives will go smoothly down here on earth, but we do know that he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. John 16, says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We're going to have tribulation. It's going to be hard. John 10, 27, 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, so we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction, Sometimes I think that's what life is, a light and momentary affliction, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we do not look to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That is our hope. And if you battle physical or mental illness, just let me comfort you with this. It won't always be this way. God loves us and he is faithful to us. Sometimes he comforts us with his presence and sometimes he uses people. But we have this hope in him and we know that no matter what our bodies do down here on earth, we have a glorified body waiting for us that is not going to feel pain. And so I hope this was a blessing to you. Um, in my next video, I'm going to talk about some practical coping strategies for battling chronic illness. And be sure to like this video if you enjoyed it. And if you enjoy my channel, you know, you can hit the subscribe and the notification bell and YouTube will let you know whenever I put out a new video. God bless.